Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, being here and joining us in this awesome journey in the promised land of web components outside of React. So, um, so yeah, for this one, we're going to talk about SDKs, web components, API. What do they have in common? And how we could use them to maybe improve our uh, final developer experience. So um, let's start with this one. What is an API? I guess you're all more or less familiar with this specific term. But first of all, an API is a programming interface, meaning that you are defining a way to help two different elements, two different components of your architecture to talk together. Um, then it's also about communicating, meaning that I want to push some kind of data, some kind of content into a component, and I want this component to be able to give me, provide me some feedback and giving me some data outside uh, as it turns. Um, so it's all about defining protocols, defining a way to help two different parts of our architecture to communicate in a standardized way, or at least in a way they could each other understand well to be able to work together. And which means that we are working remotely, which means we could work remotely in the term of geo geographically remotely, where we have um, a set of servers at some point and set of client libraries on another one, but also in the same architecture. When you are designing an application, you are designing uh, something that um, is just based on a set of different components. And one component can interact remotely with another one. When you push a button and you expect a result in another part of your interface in a reactive way, that, this is exactly that. You are remotely controlling another element from somewhere outside of this element itself. So um, let's talk about what is an API first backend or an API first service. It's probably something that is dedicated to build um, some kind of outside of your architecture computing stuff running on some servers somewhere in an edge architecture or something like that in the cloud. And you are just trying to interact with it and control it um, from your very specific client application or client library. So when you are designing an API first backend or an API first service, you are producing for your end user, your customers, a set of dedicated methods using properties and some kind of payload data to be able to interact with it by receiving a payload of data, acting, controlling, and then returning a result um, from the demanding application. So there is different type of remote API and remote service. Uh, but when we are talking um, about controlling remotely, it's more often based on HTTP request, and that's all, which means we could use SOAP or RPC, WebSocket, REST, GraphQL, whatever you want. But this is always the same thing. You are performing a request, pasting a payload, explaining what you want to achieve at some point, and the backend service is returning you some kind of answer. And the response, like, just, OK, it's done, or something more complex. So I need to interact with it. I could interact with it with just performing HTTP request with curl or something like that, passing a payload. Or I could use something more advanced, like an abstraction layer between your code base and the service that you want to use, which is a SDK, a software development kit. So you will be able to use advanced methods to, that are here to wrap the logic of your API and sending for you the kind of payload or the kind of and asking the proper endpoint, depending on what you are, you are trying to achieve at some point. Um, so what am I talking about that? Because I'm mad, I'm working uh, for, for a French uh, web hosting company. Um, I was formerly at DevRiots, which is a, a, a company, a startup dedicated to build um, tools around design system and the web component stuff. So because I'm focusing on developer experience, because I'm a developer experience engineer, and because I'm a tool nerd, I started to wonder, OK, those APIs are great. Those SDKs are great, but I'm working on the component era. And I want to have something more advanced than just a SDK that I need to put into my, my final code base. So let's talk a bit about a components philosophy. So right now, we move slowly for the last years um, from an existing world to a component-driven 
development era, which means that we are more and more working with microservices to decouple some kind of our interface just to have some more flexibility. And because we are starting to think about a component-first approach, um, we quickly had some kind of benefits coming with that, like a faster development, like simpler maintenance, like a better reusability. This one is interesting. Like a better TDD, like shorter learning curves, like a better modeling of all the system. But what I really love with this one is that I could reuse some kind of logic and just plug it into my interface and it should work. So if you think it of it as a design system, we're a designing system, we're a designing solution to help people to be empowered in what we are building. So you said web components. Okay, so what about building advanced components to handle our API logic rather than building SDK logics? Because web components are agnostic, and as Matthias said, we have the shadow DOM, so we could have some kind of complex DOM rendered as a fragment into our web page without our end user, our end user developer, thinking about how it should look like or what I have to put inside to handle the response and so on. We have some kind of attributes and properties which allow us to interact with it. And we've got event loops, which means that hey, we are free. We could definitely just hook on those events and see what the, what the result is. So let's go back to an API-driven edge world. It's more and more common to have access to Lambda functions running on a, on a server or to have access to some complex backends offered by a third-party service. And we want to use that directly into our application. But when you start thinking about front-end design, we are starting to think about UI first or UI oriented. I mean, sending a request to a payload, uh, with a payload to a, an endpoint, it's OK. But as a front-end developer, I want to handle that in a visual way because Finally, in the end, this is all about visual feedback. And this is what we are developing as a front-end developers. So I want something that is able to handle my request from my API in a visual way. And web components are great to that. Because if you think of web components as an interface to your application programming interface, then we've got attributes and properties which are just in points to control the API. We've got events, which are the outpoints of the API, some kind of response from it. And we've got all this internal logic, but we don't have to deal with it at any point because it doesn't matter. As a front-end developer, I just want to put an element, get a visual feedback from the API, and that's all. And when you think of web component like that, it's basically the definition of an API. So we could build APIs using web components. Um, there is a great service running which named um, API Video. And the purpose of API Video is to host videos somewhere in an edge architecture. And you don't have to worry about it. You just have to upload videos using um, the service and get access for, to the video at some point, you're just uploading a master. They are doing all the back-end computations, like changing the resolution, having it in different uh, frame rate or whatever you want, or different kind of resolutions. And all that you have to do is to upload the master and get the videos with some other treatment that you could achieve on it. So this is an API-first service. So you could, use, um, the, you could use it as an API to upload your file and get the player. So they are offering a lot of different SDKs, which are great. We've got an SDK for Node.js, for Java, for Python, Go, PHP, whatever you want. They also have some kind of, I don't know what are, they are, React packages. But in the end, if you want to use it from the front end, and if you want to use it using JavaScript, all that you have to do is to load the GS SDK, then put some kind of input field um, into your web page, into your DOM, then plug on it the SDK logic. And this is just for uploading, meaning that if I want to get access to the video and load the video player, then I have to load another JS file, 
containing the SDK for the video player. And I have to instantiate a new class, which is a new player SDK something by passing an ID to an element. It will get um, the power on it and manipulate to just display the video player at some point. It's, whew, it's 2022, man, OK? So it works. For sure it works. But is it really what we want to do when you are talking with our end user customers and saying, hey, you are a front end developer? I've got something for you. I've got a bunch of JS files that you have to load and interact with your DOM and so forth. Come on. So maybe we could wrap the logic into a web component. So let's try to mimic it as a component API, OK? So what do we have? We need a token, which is a property, which is your very own token to access the API service. Uh, we need to have access to a state to know where the uploading process uh, is in. Is it in progress? Is it down? Or is it not started at some point? And we need to hook on some events, live cycles, to just know where the video is loaded or not loaded, and so on. So when I, I was at DevRiots, I um, maintained a great article about comparing the different web components frameworks that you could use to develop um, an existing solution. Right now, we are comparing 61 different flavors. That's a lot. So you could pick whatever you want, from building them from scratch, from using advanced framework like Lit or whatever you think is best for you at some point to develop a web component. But because in the end, this is just a web standard, use whatever is useful for you. So for this very particular example, I use Tensil. Why? I could have used Lead. I could have used Solid. Hello, Ryan. Um, I have a project where I'm rebuilding a, a board game using web components developed with Solid. But for this one, I use Tensil. Because it's also a great library, because it has a compiler, because it has a, a syntax that is probably easier to understand for this very particular example. So I'm just creating a new component, which is the API video uploader, uh, with a dedicated style sheet. And I start my component. So I need to expose some kind of properties. So I will have access to my token, and also to the chunk size. I want to upload uh, chunks of 10 megabytes each time. So I could upload a thousand gigabyte videos to the service if I want. It doesn't matter. It's just doing uh, in the in, in in just in a row. Um, and we want a property to uh, run the service as a sandbox or uh, or in production directly. Then we will have a state containing a counter, containing a chunk progress, a total progress, um, and a status: is it the video uploading or not, and so on. So I could quickly start to generate some kind of internal properties, like the final URL for the API call, like defining the endpoint. So what about rendering it? It's just rendering uh, this famous input uh, type file somewhere, but it's inside the shadow DOM. So outside, you don't have to worry about anything. And when you choose, you pick a file, it triggers the upload method. So the upload method is what? This is just about loading the file, creating a first chunk. And this first chunk is just starting the status, so changing the status into the progress mode, starting the counter, uploading the first chunk, and uploading the chunk by itself. It's just performing an XML HTTP request, which is just asking the, the endpoint with a payload and running the application. And that's all. And over and over and over. Which means, right now, I could declare some kind of events inside my web components. I could have some kind of add points, like um, starting, uh, starting the upload, or having the upload in progress, or the upload completed, or canceled, whatever you want. Which means that if I go back to my method, I could just emit an upload started event, or I could emit each time the XML HTTP request is performed. I could easily um, emit some kind of, of events, like an upload in progress event with a new status, or an upload the completed event if I want. And from the outside, from the context of my application, I just have to listen to those events coming from my web components. And that's all. I could uh, build something uh, stronger in it. So the example is full available online. You could check it at, at any moment. I constantly improve it. So um, it's totally up to you to, to give me some feedback on it, and it, it, it would be great. So, 
the idea is that, okay, I've got this web component served from my, my third party service, but no, I want to create a reactive environment, you know? So um, the idea with this one is using what your application is made with, like, I don't know, hooks, if you want. So we emitted events from the web components itself. So from my outside of my, of my web components, from my applications, this is just targeting the component itself, adding an, an event listener on it with the proper event, like upload completed, and passing a handler, which is a total regular vanilla JavaScript syntax. And I could hook it directly into my existing application, which means I could hook it directly into my state machine. So I don't have to worry about the internal logic of my third-party API service anymore. I just have to hook my existing state machine for my application with my business logic onto the existing API events coming from outside the web component. So we went from this, like loading the script and putting an input tip file and having this bunch of JavaScript to be able to load everything and blah, 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 blah. Do that. Single component, passing the token as a property, and I have everything. Even the styles, even the final rendering, I got everything. And this component could switch directly when the video is uploaded to the video player. So I don't want to, I don't have to load the video player and blah, 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 blah. It's already done by the component itself. Video upload in, upload done, boom, you've got the player. Which is way easier to use than a SDK. The bonus point is that you could control it using attributes, meaning that what if I want to cancel the upload at any kind of any moment, then I just have to declare a new property in my component, like a canceled property, and watch the cancel, meaning that acting reactively to this property. When I put the canceled attribute into my component, I just abort my uh, XML HTTP request and emit an upload canceled event. So I just have to put the attribute on it, which is just a set attribute syntax in JavaScript. It's not that complex. And suddenly, everything stops because it's handled internally into the component. Which is great, because if you think of the component as a service, then you could, for sure, distribute it in a package registry. So you could load it into your final application and plug it into your final app and so on. That's perfectly fine. But you could also serve it in a dedicated CDN. So if you are producing an API-first service in an edge architecture, then you already get all the architecture needed to serve it as a CDN. So you just have to load the component from outside, from a dedicated CDN, offered by your service, plug it into your application, boom, you've got your uploader and your player, everything in the same place, in just one component with a few attributes, and that's all. OK, that's great, but what about my design system? Because you know I'm working with a design system, and I don't want the rendering, the final rendering of your uploader stuff, of player stuff. I want to be able to personalize um, with my very own style. Yeah, but that also it's fine. You just build an API outside of your component for that, meaning that you are exposing dedicated properties in the form of CSS custom properties, and you just have to pass it as a style to your final component when you load it, saying, OK, but I want your background color like that, and your foreground color like that, and your border like that, and the icon look like that, and that's all. So this is just passing a few uh, properties in the form of CSS elements, like we did in JavaScript to have it perfectly aligned with the rest of your design and the rest of your brand. So you have to think of your web component. You recognize this one? We, we, we had it a bit in this conference already. Um, as a, an abstraction layer, meaning that if your API changed at some point, you don't have to change it in your SDK. You don't have to inform your end user. You don't have to deprecate some, feature, some features directly. You just have to serve your web component as you did before. The internal logic is probably uploaded. But outside of that, for your front-end developer consumers, it's always the same thing. I just load a component 
with a few attributes, always the same, and it still works. And I don't have to worry about different breaking changes that you introduced into your API. So place your bets. SDKs or web components? My guess is if you are working for the front end and if you are providing an API that will be consumed at the front end at any moment, then bet on web components. Do web components, offer web components to your end user, and if you are an end user customer, ask for web components rather than SDKs. It's not that complex to do and that complex to maintain, and it would be a great addition to any kind of API for services. And you could also, for sure, provide some kind of feedback for very specific edge cases in the form of an SDK on, or in the form of API, regular API endpoint, as you wish. For the back end, for sure, we don't want this visual feedback. So SDKs are fine for that, and you could probably still keep them on tracks for that. But it also leads to the question of having web components on the server and so on, but this is not my part. Um, so thank you so much. SDK versus web components. <laughs>